That sounds better. Good morning. It's good to see everyone. Uh, if you're not aware, I'm not the pastor of this church. Um, pastor Stephen Brown is the pastor. pastor he is a tremendous leader of the church. Uh, he's off in California this, this weekend, um, where he's originally from, and, uh, and hopefully enjoying some good time with his family. Uh, he asked me uh, a number of weeks ago if I would be able to preach this Sunday, and I do come and preach from time to time. Uh, I'm just a brother in the church, recovering sinner, uh, someone who's just here to proclaim the kingdom. And that's, that's my role in the church, is just your brother. But I have some things to share today, and uh, I was in California recently, too. Um, as many of you know, uh, my father passed away at the end of July. Uh, we buried him last week in, in New York. Uh, it was a very emotional time for our family. Um, and when I was thinking about whether I was going to be preaching this, this Sunday, I, I had an original plan in mind before that happened. And as I kind of thought about it, I'm, I'm actually going to be calling upon some personal things uh, as far as what's gone up, happened in our family recently and the, the week I, I spent at my father's deathbed. But, um, but under the context of the same sermon that I think uh, God had uh, put on my heart to preach. And before we get started, uh, first of all, I want to thank the church for your prayers and support uh, during that time. It, it means a lot to us, and, and, and uh, this church means a lot to our family. Uh, I appreciate the sharing of the, of the, the, the new d disciples. That was really wonderful. Um, and it's great, it's really great to see the change that Jesus can make in a person's life uh, when they've really been converted at the heart. I want to share one thing before I begin, and that's in Ephesians chapter 6. And lest I forget, we do have Bibles for anyone who needs one, and it's yours to keep. Uh, great, hardbound, high quality, um, spotless until you start writing notes in them. And uh, we'd like, love for you to have them. We're, we're, we're here to get the Bible out into the community. We're here to teach it. Uh, we believe it's the standard for our salvation and, and the guide to how to live life. So um, looks like we've got a few out there. If you still need one, raise your hand. Uh, for the rest of us, we can turn to Ephesians chapter 6, starting in verse 2. And I share this. This is, my, my, my remarks today are not going to be a eulogy to my father. I'm going to mention some, some good things to honor him with and, and uh, my own reflections of that relationship. Yeah, I'm here to proclaim Jesus and, and the path to Jesus and the way that Jesus represents to us. Um, but I do want to share a little something because I think there's something that goes on in our culture today. We have very, you know, self-therapeutic culture. And I'm going to share something really quickly at the outset, which is one of my pet peeves, which is when people talk smack about their parents. I really don't respect that. I don't like it. I know that in many instances it might be very real. And because of the, the, how close that relationship is, and living under the same roof, and all the emotion, and psych the psychology, and the, the things you witness, and people, you know, sinners under the same home trying to figure out life, you know, and adults trying to grow up, and, and while they're still trying to help their, chi their kids grow up, there's a lot that happens, and people go through stuff, and they make mistakes, but let's go back to the commands of God. In Ephesians chapter 6, and this is really for the young people more than anything, Verse 2, it says, honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with the promise, that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction in the Lord. And there's really two parts to that that I wanted to start out for the first thing. It, it's not, there's not a qualification when it says honor your parents, it's a commandment. 
Now, if there were rough things that happened, there, and you need some, some counseling, and you need someone to talk to, that's on a need-to-know basis. That's not to just to get up on social media and, and talk about your parents and drag them through, through the mud. Because what you've done now is that other person who's heard that testimony, it's really not that useful for them. And what it ends up doing is you've now dishonored your parents in front of those people, maybe permanently. And that, the, the Bible says honor your parents through everything. And sometimes that's hard. And sometimes they've done wrong things to you, and maybe you need to talk to somebody about that, but again, on a need-to-know basis, and, and in a, still in a way that's, that's designed to be an obedient to God. Uh, and, because frankly, that respect and that honor that you give them will actually help them change as you're changing in, in, to the extent that they need to change. And then the second part I want to say is that if you have, sometimes we have resentments as young people because, notice how I tried to slip myself in there as young people, but i not quite there anymore. But um, we all have resentments that are based in things which were actually our, the responsibility of our parents to be. Like it says here in verse 4, you know, fathers, do not provoke your children to anger. You shouldn't intentionally try to, try to irk your kids just because you can. But bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. That's, that's their job, which means that sometimes you're going to be at odds, especially when you, you don't want the discipline and instruction of the Lord or any form of discipline. Um, nonetheless, Obey the, the commandment, and, and God will bless you. The title of my message today is called The Last Chapter. And for, for uh, those of you who are going to be flipping through the Bible today, there are a, a number of scriptures, but a lot of them are actually in the end of Revelation and, and the beginning of Genesis, which makes it really easy to flip around if it, you know, first a couple of pages and the last couple of pages. Um, but there'll be others as well. And Revelation is very... Very tough book, very challenging book. It's written by the Apostle John, and he's in exile on the island of Patmos. He's the last surviving apostle. It's written about 95 AD, uh, and it's a sh it's John is sharing about the visions he's had in, in, from an angel and even from Jesus himself. And I think about it for a moment. All of the other apostles and many of the other early Christians had been murdered at the time that John had written this. The people he had spent his life in the movement with, the people he had followed Jesus with. Um, and you live enough life, and this is, this, I'm saying this as I grieve my father, is you, you see people you love die. And that's a, death is a reality of life. And we're all going to have that last chapter. And not, it's not just the last chapter of our lives, but the last chapter that we're going to be able to experience with someone that we're going to lose. And, and the longer you live, the more people you lose. And it should affect how you, how you handle those relationships, knowing that they're not forever. The book of Revelation is also about the end of the world great tribulation of the churches, the return and reign of Jesus Christ, the destruction of Satan, the final judgment, and it's a judgment that we will all face. And so this, this sermon is designed to help us think about meeting Jesus in the end, and are we prepared for judgment. And sharing that, I'm, actually I told you I was going to share a couple um, personal things. And I, I really thought a lot about this in the spirit of what I shared at the beginning about, about honoring your parents. You know, and it's, it's three things that my dad shared with me on, on his uh, deathbed. And, you know, he also shared things with each of my, my two siblings. And he had thought about this, even though he wasn't really sure. He had, he had, he had, he had been to the emergency room this was the third time in about a month's time, and, and, and I really got the sense that, that I needed to get out there and quickly. And I was lucky to do that. I jumped on the first flight on the Monday morning of that week, um, 
He was in the emergency room. And I, first, I have to say, to people who work uh, in hospitals, man, that's, that's, a, that's a hard hustle. I, I, I give you a lot of credit. And I can understand um, the, the special emotional toll that can take when you see people suffering. And there's only so much you can do for them. And you know that some of them are going to die. That's, a lot of us are completely removed from that. And um, it was terrible to be in that emergency room watching the people, some people sitting in the hallway, you know, in beds in the hallways because they couldn't find a room for them. Um, just, just in agony. And, um, you know, and some people are popping in and out. I mean, actually, think of that, that, about that the next time you go running to the ER when you don't really need to go to the emergency room because there are people who really, really do need it. And um, it's, it's, it's a heavy place to be. And my father was in there, and I got to his bed, and my, my, my other siblings were, were coming as well. And, and at, at a certain point, he reflected, well, I guess this is pretty serious since, since you're all here. And he knew. Um, one of the things he shared with me um, is he said the, these words to me. He says, you know, you, you are... He said, you are one of my best friends. And point one is that the Father wants your friendship. Give me a second. Let's read from uh, Revelation chapter 22, which is the last chapter in, in the Bible, verses 1 through 5. And there it reads, Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city, also, on either side of the river, the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads, and night will be no more. They will need no light of lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light." And they will reign forever and ever. You know, this is the end that God has planned for those who love him. And it's a beautiful end. Healing of the nations. Good Lord, could we use that right now? Being able to see the face of God face to face. And everything about us will reflect God and everything that's good about God and this eternal reign with God to the very end of the age. When I think about that's what our Father wants for us. That's the end that he has planned for us. And if you've had kids, you, you have a lot that you want for them. You, you want so much for them to... to to find their calling, to find happiness in life, to, to not make the same mistakes that you've made. You, you, you root for them. You know, I, one of the things I remember from my, my own childhood, I remember specifically, um, you know, my, my, is the, I played a lot of sports as a kid, and I, f I remember the first game where I scored a couple goals in a soccer game. And it had actually been a while, because I used to, I, I played on these select teams, but I was, um, I was usually doing slide tackles all over the field. I just was really into that and, and, and liked getting into the scrum more than actually getting into the goal. And so when I finally scored a couple goals in this one game, and I just remember looking over at the sideline, my dad just like cheering, like jumping up and down on how excited he was. And um, 
That's, a, that's an image I'll never forget. You know, and, and that's, that's the way, you know, our Father looks at us through life, is, is cheering us on when we have victory. And when we, when we, when we reach, when we pass a threshold and overcome something and start, you know, believing in ourselves, in, in believing in him, in believing what he's been teaching us. And I think that that, um, when I think about my own dad, there were a lot of things that he did and that most parents do, a lot of parents will do with, with young children. They try to think, make things special. You try to make holidays special. You know, I remember, we, um, you know, he'd write poems to my mom for the Christmas gifts. And they would be like a little hint about what the gift was about. And he'd try to buy, like, special things. And when you try to buy special things for your, your family, it's like a special delight in life when, you ha when you're able to do something for the, for the kids that really excites them. Um, my dad was a very avid reader. Uh, that's why I knew when I hadn't heard from him, we say we were, we were like best friends. It was because he, he would, we would call, we'd talk, we'd, he'd write, send me emails. Uh, his mind was fresh till the very end. Um, he, liked, he loved to talk about public affairs. For a, few, for a number of years, he was the opinion editor of a Sacramento Bee newspaper. In 1982, he wrote a book called Water and Power about the whole history of, of, of water supply and, and, and the development of Los Angeles. Uh, the New York Times declared it one of the best books of 1982. Got nominated for a Pulitzer Prize in history. And uh, it was one of the great aspects of his life's work. And now, I don't believe everything in the New York Times, but you can believe that. Um, and, and I think he just loved ideas. He taught people to love ideas. He taught us as a family to, to, to think, to be engaged. And so when he didn't contact me about the assassination attempt on former President Trump, the Republican National Convention, the, uh, President Biden set, stepping down as the nominee, these were all like bang, 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 heavy, huge things that he would have loved to have talked about. Um, that was part of a hint that I knew something was, was wrong. Um, Revelation 22, let's go back to verses 8 and 9. And there's another aspect of what's waiting for us and what God wants for us as his children. He says, I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things. And when I heard and saw them, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who showed them to me. But he said to me, you must not do that. I am a fellow servant with you and your brothers, the prophets, and with those who keep the word, the words of this book. Worship God. Another thing that's waiting for us at the last chapter is that we actually have equality with the angels. We're just as precious to God as the angels themselves. And, and, he, and what, what the angel's telling him in this vision is like, what you're doing by teaching the word of God to people, and by loving people, and, and, and by bringing people to Jesus is just as important as anything that any angel will ever do. And that, that that is how God views us, as part of his family. And this is, Revelation 22 is a vision of how he wants to end it for his children. Flip over to Genesis chapter 1. I told you this would be easy. In verses 26 and 27, we learn about the creation of man. And the point I want to make to you is that you were created by God. The Psalms talk about how he knew you in your womb, how he knitted you together. And you were created in love. The act of creation was an act of love. The Apostle John writes, we, we, and, and, and Pastor uh, Brown had taught it from uh, first John not too long ago and it's, it says that God is love and love needs something needs an object on which to, to, to express itself and, and you are that object that's what you were created for and I know some of us we may have come we've been created in, in, in our biologically in challenging circumstances and we, some of us may not even know our, our birth father but, but the God who created you, created you in love. And we look in Genesis 1, it says, Then God said, in verse 26, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, 
And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. When we say that God created man in his own image, that means that we are part of God's legacy. You know, you're, 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 God is invested in you, and we know so much about how that important that is to God because we, we, you look in the, throughout the Bible, some of the hardest parts of the Bible to get through are, are the genealogy because you've got long, long passages of who was the father of who and who was the father of who and who was the father of who. And... It's in there because it's important. Because where you come from is important. And who, who you come from is, is important. I think, some, unfortunately, we've, we've, uh, we, we, we've redefined family in this culture. And there's a reason about, for that that I, I, I'm going to address here shortly. But it's so much of the Bible is about the analogy of the relationship between the father and the child and the husband and the wife. And that, that, those analogies that God makes repeatedly throughout the Bible, based upon the, the, the standard that he creates for those relationships, helps you understand God himself. Helps you understand how the church is supposed to function. It helps you understand how you're supposed to, how to have a marriage. How to be a father or a mother. And if you haven't had insight or access to the biblical example of that, you don't quite have the, you don't understand the reference to the full extent that God wants you to understand it. And that's not your fault. A lot of us, we've come in, you know, it's our fault that we have been in sin, but we got called when we got called. And it's not your fault whatever family you got called from. But one of the things we want to do is we want to try to redeem our legacy and, 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 and create a trajectory for our own families based upon the word of God and based upon the foundation of these relationships. Because my kids are my legacy. And, and there's a lot, some of you, you may be taking care of your grandkids. There's a lot of things that go on in families. Some of you uh, may be in adopted families. There's a lot, I understand. And, and, and it's, it's wonderful to take in orphans, and it's wonderful when families try to rally around a, a, a situation that may not be as, as functional as it should be. Um, and it's wonderful when someone comes in as, and is a father figure. But um, you can have many father figures, but you can only have one real father. The Bible doesn't, it doesn't talk about that, and it certainly doesn't talk about baby mamas and all the sort of, sort of things that we talk about now. Or it's complicated. It's not, no, that's not how it's supposed to be. And so what we want to do as a church is help and disciple each other to how it's supposed to be. So that the next generation can have something a little better than what we had. You know, I, I, I don't believe personally. I mean, I, look, I, I'm a healthy person. I did, did fairly well in a few things in life. Um, I had a family member who was a sperm donor. And somebody said, why, why weren't you a sperm donor? I, I couldn't even possibly imagine that. And it's not for the reason, whenever you hear somebody talk about, you know, you talk to non-Christians and they say, oh, they'll, they'll, they'll make some reference. Some of you may have had these conversations. Oh, isn't there something about, there about like spread, you know, spreading your, your seed? Or, um, it's like, that, that there is, but it's not about that. And it's not, you're, you're completely got that st story wrong. It's like, this is how you tell me you've never read the Bible by not tell, without telling me that you've never read the Bible, because that's not what that story is about. But the importance here is that my children are my DNA. They have my blood running through their veins. They have some of my inclinations and my strengths and weaknesses programmed into them. They're a reflection of me, and I'm the only person who knows what it's like to be me. And we, we are God's DNA. He created us. He wants that. Just like I'm not indifferent to what happens to my, my children. 
and where they are and with the life what we've tried to build together. You know, I, I love a lot of kids. I've coached a lot of kids. I've taught. I've tutored. I have other members of my family, but, but my daughter Kayla is mine. My son Peter is mine. Makoa, who many of you know, and Peter's here as well, is mine. And I, I am deeply invested in what happens to them and the choices that they make and, and, and um, the blessings that they have and the, and the challenges I hope they'll overcome. Turn really quickly to Matthew chapter 7. This is probably an easier one for you to find as well. And this is from the Sermon on the Mount. It says, starting in verse 7, it says, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks, it will be opened. Or which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father, who is in heaven, give good things to those who ask him? For a lot of, unfortunately, some people don't have a father, and they don't know that relationship that the, that the father has with the child and want, you know, the idea that you're going to go to dad for something good and he, and he gives you something absolutely horrible to torment you. <laughs> that's not, Jesus is using this example and Christ saying, you know, that's, of course not. So why would you think of God like that? Like God is wanting to vex you. God wants to hurt you. God's desire for you is something bad. When you're asking for something good, it's, you, that, if, if you have that sense, we need to change our picture of God into the picture that's in the Bible. Because it's a loving Father who wants what's best for us. And if we flip back very quickly to Genesis chapter 2, this is true even in, the, in, in terms of the marital relationship. Because when God created man, he gave, God, he gave man and woman, he gave them things to do in a wonderful place. And, and pure and open friendship with God in the Garden of Eden. And he always said, hey, look, there's one thing that I don't want you to do. Just one. Everything else is enjoy. And I've given you, I've even given you, you know, you get to name all the animals. You get, you get, you've got dominion, you've got things, you've got a role in life. And a lot of us, we want to set up our kids, like, well, figure out a career for them. Figure out, you know, help them go to college. Figure out what it is that they're good at and, and, and harness those strengths. And God is saying, like, that, that's how I am. And he even says, you know, trying to figure out how to have a, a family and build the next generation. It says in verse 24, he said, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Like, you know, God invented sex. You know, God's not against sex. But sex is something that plays a role that God created for, in, in a certain context that's going, that, that in cer certain contexts is very encouraging and life-infirming and, and the most natural thing that can ever happen to you. In other ways, it can be very enslaving. It can, be, uh, it can cause a lot of human, uh, lo loss of human dignity. It can be very uh, addictive. It can be very, um, cause a lot of chaos when we abandon the position that, that God had, had it placed in our lives. And the last point on this is in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Starting in verse 3. This is the Apostle Paul writing. He said, The husband should give to his wife her conjugal rights. And likewise, the wife to her husband. For the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does over her. But the husband does. Likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Do not deprive one another, except perhaps by agreement for a limited time, that you may devote yourselves to prayer, but then come together again, so that Satan may not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. 
The last time I preached, I talked about how we have certain dogmas that we teach that are actually contrary to the Bible. Um, and we, because we've, they've become a substitute for the Bible. And there, I think there was a perception at one point, and sometimes Christians have, 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 have created that perception that, you ever heard this one, that sex is only for procreation? I don't actually know a lot of Christians who, 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 who practice it, um, and, and I don't know that many that preach it, but I've heard that many times over. But if you read this passage and you read Genesis, it's like, well, no, that, no, actually God created it because he knew that. Just like the other things that we talked about, about wanting, you need, you need, you need a fish, you need something, you need a role in life, you need, you need a relationship with God. God knew that this was something you would need too. And he said, you know what, the Christian marriage that he's defining here, it doesn't say anything here about procreation. It's, it's talking about protecting each other and taking care of one another for, for the husband and the wife. And it's talking about creating that, in, in Genesis, that sense of bonding of one flesh. When we're in it, everything together, complete unity. And, and if you look at this, this is actually kind of a high standard. It says, you know what? You should have tons of sex with your spouse and then take a break for prayer. That's what Christian marriage is supposed to be. A lot of sex, a lot of prayer. Amen. Sounds pretty good to me. <laughs> if, we try to, if we try to just adhere to the standard, to think, the thought is that the God created all these things because he knew we needed them and he does care about us. And, it, and, and if we would apply his way, God has planned this because God is a friend to mankind, not his enemy. Point two, a second thing my dad shared with me on, on that, that first day after I flew in and, and rushed to the hospital, he said, I was afraid of losing you. And that is the point. Point two is the father is afraid of losing you. You know, it's funny, a lot of us who have raised kids or, or remember our times with our parents, we, there's a lot of fun and sweet times in the early days and a, and a lot of affection. And then suddenly it, it's not quite the same. And some of that is a function of the decisions that you make as you get older and, and the rebellion. Um, you know, it's funny, uh, my dad would still come to my games in, in high school, but we, we were we would hardly really talk at certain points. Later on, I saw he even made scrapbooks of some of the things, that, you know, when I'd get in the newspaper for football or basketball. We had played for some pretty good teams that made it um, in state playoffs in California, and I uh, got, got in the paper a few times. Um, and he had scrapbooks of all those games. And he took video of the games, but after the game, I often would, we'd drive separately. You know, I, I didn't, you know, I'd drive home with another family because we, we, weren't, we weren't close for a while. Um, when I went to college, I'd call home to talk. My, my dad would hand the phone to my mom. We had, a, we had, we had rough, some rough times. And if you look in the book of Revelation, go back to 22, the last chapter. It says in verses 10 and 11. It says, and he said to me, do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is near. Let the evil doer still do evil and the filthy still be filthy, and the righteous still do right, and the holy still be holy. Behold, I am coming soon, bringing my recompense with me to repay each one for what he has done. You notice how we get, I, you know, I, I gave you all this lovey-dovey language at the beginning here, and then all of a sudden, let the filthy be filthy. And how did you become something filthy in the sight of God? the Father. Well, it's because of some of the choices that we make to hurt God, to hurt the Father, in disregard of the Father. Flip back to Genesis chap chapter 3. Again, it's, I'm making it easy. It's front, front, front and back. It can't be that hard. In verses 8 and 9, this talks about the fall of man and uh, in, in, in the temptation. Actually, we'll just focus right on, on verse 9. 
Well, I'll, I'll read them both. And they heard, they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the, in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? Where are you? When you think about that friendship, that bond, that God had created man to love him and provide for him and give him anything that he needs, and we're hiding from God. And God is asking you today, where are you? We, had it, we were like this. I designed you to be this close to me. Where are you? What happened? What have you chosen that's more important than me? And what are you hiding from God? Where are you in your worship? You know, where are you in your reading of the Bible and the love for the Bible in your personal repentance? Where are you in your family and trying, trying to redeem your family? Where are you in just the way that you love God in, your, in the times that you're alone with God? Where, where are you? And one of the things I think about is, you know, often, you know, lots of philosophers like to talk about, okay, there was the tree of life, which we see both in Genesis and in Revelation at the very end, and from the beginning and the end. And there's this, the, 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 the forbidden fruit in the, the tree of the knowledge of, 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 of good and evil. And I want to say something really quick. A lot of people, do you think that Adam and, I were, Adam and Eve were physically blind? Like, actually physically blind? I, I actually don't believe that. I don't think that's what the Bible teaches. There is some disagreement on that. Do your own research, come to your own conclusion. I think it would be pretty hard to name all the animals in the garden if you can't see them. That, that would be pretty challenging, you know, then to making a distinction. Well, how do I know this is a bluebird or that's a blackbird? I, you know, it would be very helpful to be able to see. So when I think the, the, uh, the idea that um, they're blind is like a blind to, to good and evil. And I think that's what that's getting at. Turn over to the book of Titus. And it, it's in the New Testament, Paul's letter to Titus. And once you hit the T's, 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, the last of the T's, they're all lined up together, is Titus, one after the other. And in, in chapter 1, verses 15 and 16, it says this, to the pure, all things are pure. But to the defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. But both their minds and their consciences are defiled. They profess to know God, but they deny him by their works. They are detestable, disobedient, unfit for any good work. You know, Adam and Eve, I don't think they were physically blind, but they were blind to evil and to the pure, all things are pure. Like, you know, it's that, that, that really sp super spiritual person that doesn't get the dirty joke, because they're, they're not even in that. They don't even think that way. That's not part of what they're all about. And I'd ask you, to what benefit have you derived from knowing evil? What did we, what did we get out of that deal? And the problem with knowing evil is that you just know more and more and more of it. And you get more and more deeply ingrained in it. And, that's, and unfortunately, that's what's happened. We've talked about what's happened to our families and what's happened to our legacies is that you end up having a continual appetite for more and you start crossing. Each line that God has set, we keep crossing those lines. To what benefit? To what benefit whatsoever? To us, to our families, to our, to our salvation. We want to start unlearning evil. And... And one of the sad things is that God had set this one thing, don't do this one thing in the garden. And the problem is, is once you did that one thing, once Adam and Eve did that one thing, it's like now they found all sorts of new ways to hurt God. Now they knew that they, could, they ran the gamut. 
and, 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 and there's so many passages and so much of the books and the prophets are talking about, and God is using, speaking through the prophets about, my heart is burning for you. This is how much I've hurt you, hurting me. This is how much you're grieving me because God wants that fellowship with us. of like a best friend. And we intentionally hurt him and disobey, disobey him. And, and I think I want to be in the interest of time. Let's flip over. I'm going to spare you a little portion that was a little bit of me riffing on some things that are uh, related to the Bible or in the Bible specifically. So I'm going to save that for another time. Flip over to uh, the book of Nehemiah. If you, if you hit the Psalms, you need to go back earlier in the Bible. If you've gotten to 1 Kings, 2 Kings, flip a little bit further, deeper into the Bible. And I, I quote from this because you remember Pastor Stephen frequently has a stand up the first time he reads a passage. And he, he, he talks about Ezra when he spoke to the, when he spoke to the Israelites. And he, and he said the people would stand up when the Bible was read. And actually, if you read further in there, they would actually bow down on the ground when they prayed. And we could have a really good calisthenics going on in here, especially with all these scriptures that I'm reading. But, um, and honestly, that's the way to do it. Um, we have limited time here because of the rental space. But if I thought, look, if we, if we had our own building and we're here all Sunday, it would be old time religion, boy. I'll tell you what, we'll be, we'll be here a long time. And we'd get on those knees and pray as a church with power. The, the roof would be shook. And we'd cover a lot of Bible. But, I, you know, I'm going to let you sit. Um, but one of the things that the reaction often when people would find the Bible, would rediscover the Bible and look at themselves, they'd be grieved. And in the passages that Pastor Stephen t frequently references, if you look here in Nehemiah chapter 8, starting in verse 9, it says, And Nehemiah, who was the governor, and Ezra the priest, and scribe, and the Levites who taught the people, said to all the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people wept as they heard the words of the law. Then he said to them, go your way, eat the fat and drink sweet wine and send portions to anyone who has nothing ready. For this day is holy to our Lord. And do not be grieved for the, day, the joy of the Lord is your strength. So the, the, the Levites calmed all the people saying, be quiet for this day is holy. Do not be grieved. And, 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 and I share that because often sometimes I look at the Bible and the way it's supposed to be. And then I look at my life. And I look at how a Christian is supposed to act. And I make, look at some of the times when I didn't act that way. And I look at the condition of my family. And I, I, I'm, I have a lot to be grateful for. But I also think of like how the, you know, a really in real deep family worship and fellowship. And it's something I'm going to talk about in my, in my next point regarding my father. It's not what it ought to be. It's not what the Bible says. And we look at, you know, how, and, and often when you see the shortcoming, if, you've, if you have a heart for God, your heart is cut when you realize, man, that, you know, it, 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 this is what God is asking for me, and I'm not doing it. And, 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 and this is what God wanted for his people. And here, we're supposed to be here. And look at where we're at and the things that we're involved in and the, and the, the trifling nature of our decisions and the, and the folly and the evil. The people wept when they heard the word preached because they were ashamed. But, you know, the, one, the nice thing here is that, is that the prophet said, look, you know what? The joy of the Lord is your strength. I'm telling you these things because you need to hear them. But I do love you. And God, the, the joy, the, the, the good news is that God wants to redeem you. God wants you to, to, to be able to achieve what it is that he set forth. He wants to help you to obey him. And it starts with that broken heart and that broken spirit. Like, I want to change. If you're responding to the gospel that way, I'm hopefully, you know, I'm not beating you up. And I, I don't want you to beat me up, but I want you to help me to obey God. 
And, 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 and that's what the word is here, is, is that we are going to celebrate. We're going to celebrate with the food afterwards. We're going to celebrate in the fellowship. We're gonna, but we're also going to be grieved by, like, God, we want, we want to be a more biblical church. We want to have more impact. We want to be a more loving people. We want to be a more holy people. We want everything that we do to reflect you. Point three, and we'll close here. The last day, my dad actually died on an early Friday morning, and I was blessed to be there with him um, when he passed, if you, if you regard that as a blessing. Um, his kidneys were failing. The toxins that get into your body when your kidneys aren't working right, he had a, a number of other health issues. You know, it starts, to, it starts to fog the brain. So while he was somewhat conversational on the Monday and a part of the Tuesday, um, by late Tuesday, there wasn't, he, he was losing his sense of where he was, and uh, by, by Wednesday, it was, it was uh, it, there wasn't much to, in terms of conversation, and then he was pr- pretty much asleep the last day and a half to two days of his life. But that Tuesday night, he, my family had gone home, I had come back, and it was late in the night in the hospital, and it was just the two of us in his room. And, um, you know, I, I, I just played. My, my dad was not a church-going person. You know, over the years, we had um, some conversations. Um, he had grown up a little bit in the church, but that wasn't, you know, he had, he had left it. He was a child of the 60s, and I think a lot of, uh, one of the unfortunate things is I think a lot of us, we think, when we think about how we got to where we are culturally in our families and otherwise, I think we, we haven't really reconciled the sexual revolution and, more importantly, the socialist revolution. And, like, sometimes we have, like, tens of millions of people died through murder and war and starvation and disappearing in the 20th century because of socialism. And we don't really talk that much about of it, about that. And... Um, Pastor Brown has mentioned about how we end up, government doesn't like to share the heart or the mind or the control with God and the church. And so, frankly, a lot of what we've come to believe has been, has been because of that moment in history that we haven't really had a reckoning about. Um, and that is an intended result of socialism, is to, is to undermine the church, undermine the family, undermine any relationship that doesn't recognize the supremacy of the state. And it's a conversation we, we should have in, in, in greater length, I think, as a society, understanding what happened. You know, there were three billion people in Cambodia, a million, of, a third of the population dead in a, in a very short time span. All that famine you heard about in East, a- East Africa, that's a product of socialism. You, know, you don't think there's a difference between South Korea and North Korea? And the quality of life for Christians and the quality of life just for the average person, there's a, there's a major difference. And we should be thinking about, how, you know, how these things impact Christians. But my dad was a product of the 60s. And he, he um, a lot of people stopped going to church. And he was one of those people. And um, I was not raised in a church. I told you there was a rough time in our relationship. One of the re- ways that we reconciled was, was basically me not waiting for apologies from him, but me make, doing the apologizing. And not, not, not needing one back. Because you know what? That relationship between father and son, he's father, I'm son. You know, I, I, you know and, and, and me being humble gave him an opportunity to be humble. But while I'm still recognizing his authority, because that's a God-given authority. But here's what he said in that room. I, I was playing hymns for him because I knew he would have recognized him from his youth. You know, you know, then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. You know, what, what a friend we have in Jesus. And I just prayed for him. You know, he remarked to me, you know, how he liked the music. It was just the two of us sitting in, sitting in the dark, the quiet. You know, I didn't really know what else to do. I wasn't going to try to force him into a baptistry. You know, I don't, you know, it's something you have to decide for yourself. 
and it is, I, I want to, I don't, I, I want to be careful because I don't want to mischaracterize what he might have meant. It could have meant a lot of things given the condition that he was in. He's a very smart man, and he was familiar with the Bible. There was a time early in his youth where he was learning, learning uh, Hebrew. He wanted to go into ministry. Um, he said these words out of the blue. He says, you know, I, I don't want to be what I am. I, I want to be a different person. And that's the last substantive thing that he said to me. And that may very well have meant, you know, look, I don't want to be what I am, this guy sitting in this hospital dying and having, you know, and, and feeling all these maladies. It could very well mean that. Um, you know, it was in response to just a lot of very rich hymns that I was just playing quietly in the room. And I think a lot of us, when we're thinking about when we're going to confront God and, be, 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 and stand before the throne of God, we're going to have to say, you know, you know I, I, don't, I don't want to be what I am. Yeah, I wish I was a different person. I wish I had made different choices. I wish I had been more righteous. I wish I had loved God more. I wish I had done this with my family. I don't know if that hits with any of you. I have regrets. I have things I wish I could do a do-over. And my point three is, are you ready for the last chapter? The last chapter as it's described here in Revelation, are you ready to stand before God in a spirit of fellowship? Are you ready for the last chapter with the people that you love? Are you prepared? You don't know when that's going to be. If I have one regret, I, let's, let's flip over to 1 Timothy. Again, it's in that T section of the Bible. And I, I, I say this recognizing how little control I have over things in life. But it's something that I worry about when I think about my dad. In, in my family, in my children. Because I, I've, I've gone through a journey in my own Christian life where times of, of, of great victories and times of, of major defeats. And in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 16, says, Keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching. Persist in this, for by doing so, you will save both yourself and your hearers. The NIV translation translates it this, as, this way. It says, guard your life and your doctrine. Your life, how you live your Christian life matters, not just to you and yourself and your own salvation, but to those who are hearing you and observing your life. And also guard your doctrine. What the Bible actually teaches is more important than what you teach about God. And both of them are equally important. The way you live, the choices you make. And when you're in a family, you know, people see your whole life. They see the whole span, the good and the bad, the ups and the downs. And there's times I feel, uh, some, feel guilt, you know, for the downs. When my family's had to witness me go through some down, down time as a Christian. And I wonder, you know, how did I, how did I hurt their image of God? Through, through my bad choices. He said, guard your life and your doctrine. But then you just have to re believe that God is sovereign. You know, that I, I don't save people, God, God saves people. And if you've had um, down times, and you've wondered how that's impacted other people, and how you've represented Christ to others, if you backslid into sins that you said you repented of uh, or just lost, lost your cool and, and made decisions or got caught up in a cultural moment, you know, first of all, one of the best things you can do is apologize and acknowledge it. But one of the best things we can do as well is the Bible talks about getting entangled in sin. And it, when it talks about falling away from the living God, it says if you've been entangled in sin and overcome. And that's really the question. If you weren't overcome, and you're still showing up, and you've learned, 
Amen. You know, that's something your family can learn from too, is seeing, the, seeing you overcome that struggle, seeing you not give up on the Lord, see, seeing you realize that th- this is the only word of life. And when, when we say this church, we ch- teach that this is the way, because Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. There is, there is no other way. And that, that way is it's a path that you need to walk on. It's a way of life that you need to live. And if you've had personal failure, you just, just get disentangled. And, and honestly, that's inspiring too, when you're able to get back on your feet and follow the Lord. We're going to end up at the very end of Revelation chapter 22. In verses 14 through 17, it said, Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to the tree of life and that they may enter the city by the gates. Outside are the dogs and sorcerers and the sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. I really want to emphasize that last part because, you know, particularly in an election cycle, there is a lot of lying going on. And if we choose one side or the other, our side is lying. For sure, whoever you voted for, whoever you've ever voted for is lying. And I've met a lot of political people. I've met the current president, the current vice president. I've met a lot of political people in my life. And I'm not saying that I'm any necessarily better than they are, but they lie. They definitely lie. And the, and the, tra- the activist groups lie. The media that you read lies. The, the fact checkers who are supposed to be checking lies, they lie too. That's a reality. And so we have to be really careful what we say, that we're not lovers of falsehood to try to get the upper hand in some discussion. And that we be very careful. And, that, and remember, we're not part of any... The movement that we're a part of that matters is the movement to save souls. That's, all, that's it. Everything else is a distraction. And if you, when you're making a shrewd decision about the election cycle, it's like whatever is going to make less of a burden in me doing that. That's, that's really the, what, what it comes down to. But he says, you know, this, this, it says in verse 17, the spirit and the bride say, come and let the one who hears say, come and let the one who is thirsty come, let the one who desires to take the water of life without price. And I, say, I share this passage because there's a lot of discussion about what things are binary in society. Is gender binary? Yes. Many things in life are, are binary. And, and salvation is binary. Heaven and hell are binary things. It's one or the other. Being pregnant and not being pregnant, those are what's one or the other. You know, did you pay your taxes or did you not pay them? One or the other. Did you, come, did you show up or did you not show up? It's, it's one or the other. Are you faithful or are you not faithful? It's binary. And it's funny because a lot of us, you know, you hear this, 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 people say, hey, you know, only God can judge me. Only God, I think there's even songs about that. It's like, which is a silly thing to say because you get evaluated all the time. You're getting judged at work, you get judged at school, you get judged on your behavior, you get judged on your clothes, you get judged on, on your effort, your talent level. Of course, you're getting evaluated all the time. Now, only God can judge whether you're going to heaven, but he will judge. And we do, we do need to care about that. It's his decision. It's not my decision. It's his decision whether anyone I love makes it to heaven. It's not my decision. I, I'm not going to change the Bible to say what his decision is, but ultimately it's, it's his decision. But I want to say as we think about the last chapter, it's heartbreaking to think of the people you love not making it to heaven. It's heartbreaking. You know, one of the things I wrestled with was, did I advocate enough? Was I too timid? Was it, was, was, what, 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 did I care enough? And, and I don't want to make that mistake with anyone else I love. Because what I really wanted with my father was the, the full fellowship of, of, as, as brothers in the Lord. Like really deep love and, and fellowship. It's the same thing I want for my kids. It's the same thing I want my wife. It's the same thing I would want with anyone in this church and anyone outside this building, but especially with the people in my family. 
Let's close out Revelation 22, verse 20. He says, he who testifies to these things says, surely I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Just come, Jesus. You know, through all, through, you know, trust in his decisions about all these things we've talked about. But if you're loving Jesus, you just can't wait for his return. And all the good things, it's going to be glorious, just as we read at the beginning. It's going to be wonderful. Love people enough to tell them about it. Love them enough for that and want it for yourself. Verse 21. I hope this has helped you all. I hope you're preparing for the last chapter of your lives and the last chapter you'll experience with the people that you care about. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you all. Amen. Actually, I'm going to say a quick prayer before the, before the song uh, as the singers get organized. God in heaven, thank you so much for this time together to worship you. God, thank you for all the ways that you have blessed us. Uh, and God, the way you've blessed my family. The God, the way you have um, shown me mercy and shown mercy to your church. And Lord, we just thank you for your, your, how, how glorious you are, how marvelous you are for your Bible and how it, it cuts our hearts. And God, we thank you for heaven and the hope we have of it. Uh, Lord, help us be the people you want us to be, the fathers you want us to be, the, the, the children you want us to be, the parents, the, the brothers and sisters to each other. And God, help this church truly reflect your glory and prepare people for the last chapter. We love you so much. We pray this in the name of our Holy Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.
Lunch awaits, and I don't want to delay that. Uh, if we could get the, um, the the prayer team up here very quickly, I want to uh, pray for the food, which I think is a good thing for us to do together. But but also, uh, I want to remind we we were before uh, the current events with my family, we were setting up a uh, folk, uh, foundations of the faith class. I want to say that. We're going to start that up again on Tuesday to get that rolling. Um, it'll be done online. If you're interested, uh, please come see me after the, uh, uh, if you're not on that list. Uh, you're going to learn some basics about the faith. Well, what is this Christianity? What does the Bible say is sin? How do I repent? Why, why do I get baptized? What, what, what does the Bible teach on a number of core subjects? And um, What's it like to be a disciple? What, 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 are the, what are the requirements of being a Christian? What, what is God expecting me to do next? Uh, so we're going to go through some of those things. Um, if you have something you need to pray about, you need someone to talk to or confess to, uh, we have, we have uh, volunteers here who will certainly respect your confidentiality, but get, some, get, some, get, get whatever uh, off your chest or in your heart, but be sure to uh, deal with that. So... Um, other than that, I'll, I'll say a prayer for the food. Please remember to grab your kids from the children's ministry so the teachers can get some food too. Thank you, Lord, so much for this service, and thank you, God, for hearing our prayer, and thank you, God, for the food and all those in the church who helped prepare it. Uh, we pray that you just bless this time together in fellowship and uh, bless the, the, the time that uh, we enjoy the rest of this day in, in worship of you. And we pray this all in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you.